neither white nor black as well as I can find out. But this is a this is a isolated, multi-generational mixed group of people. So they were kind of able to find this safe haven and define themselves freely in a place that didn't require you to be defined. Hi, I'm Danielle Romero. Thank you so much for being with me here on my channel. I've been delving into American identity and family stories and hidden history and definitely touching on the Melungeon side of things. Uh, I started out researching Creole history and I believe my mom's grandmother was Creole from Louisiana, but that's kind of led me down the path of researching Melungeon roots and Redbone roots, and they're all kind of intersecting someplace. And, you know, being a New Yorker trying to dig into records from Louisiana and understand who my family really was, it's convoluted. And I tell this story frequently on this channel because I think it's just so indicative of this issue of showing up to research your family in a location that you're not familiar with, and you don't really know how things are there. And so I went to Louisiana for the first time a couple years ago to meet family and start the research and just get boots on the ground, you know, because I've been researching from afar. And one of the cousins from that side of the family met with me. And as soon as he met me, he told me I was a red bone. <laughs> you know? I was like, I, I know the band. I don't think I know what you're saying, though. And honestly, he could not have been more right. So we're going to talk about red bones today. Who were the red bones? Who are the red bones? Where did the red bones come from? But before we get started on that, I want to just thank so many of you for being a part of the channel. It's been my first full year on YouTube, which is amazing. I'm having so much fun with you. I want to say thank you to those who watch and share and comment and create this great community in the comment section. I'm learning so much from you. And also want to thank the incredibly generous people who've been buying me coffees. I am not kidding. People are sending me coffees like this guy right here. Just picked him up. Actually, I, I'm trying lattes for the first time and I kind of like them. But no, they're not mailing these to me. Uh, but they're donating through a link that's called buy me a coffee, essentially. And I, I definitely go and I sit and I edit or I read or I brainstorm at the coffee shop. Sometimes you just need to like kind of get out of your head and get in a new location. I want to jump right in. Let's talk about the red bones. Now, one of the things I've seen in comments when I've mentioned red bone in other videos are people talking about this cultural understanding of what red bone has meant in the black community. That's not what I'm talking about today. So red bone, and there's also like high yellow, yellow bone. These are ways that uh, folks in the black community kind of talk about lighter skin members uh, or people that have like just more of a yellow hue to their skin or a red hue. And that's a common thing, especially in the South. But actually red bone is a specific ethnic group from Louisiana and parts of Texas. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with that other definition, but it kind of does. And we're going to get to that. There is this ambiguity of who's a red bone. And it's been ambiguous for a long time. There is a letter from 1893 written by a man named Albert Rigmaven, and he was treasurer. And he was writing back to a man named McDonald Furman. This was a man who was conducting private ethnological research, and he's exchanging letters, inquiring about the red bones. He's like, I need to know who these people are. What can you tell me? What was interesting about the letter, before I read it, is he's writing to him in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Lake Charles, Louisiana, a lot of red bones there, and actually showed up as one of my mom's DNA communities like Charles. And I was really surprised by that. So this is kind of creating context for me as I'm researching. So here's what he wrote. He wrote, Dear Sir, in reply to your letter of April 22nd, I will say I am unable to tell you how the name Redbone originated for the people called Redbones. And I think the Negroes were the first to give them that name as they, the Negroes, have no use or love for them, and they do not like the Negroes any better. I suppose you know the kind of people called Redbones. They are neither white nor black, as well as I can find out. The oldest ones came from South Carolina many years ago. There are a great many of them in this parish, and in Rapids, and Vernon Parish, and some other parishes in the state of Louisiana, and a good many in Texas, too. Some of these people are as good citizens as anybody, and some are rascally and treacherous, but you will find that among any people. So this treasurer for the parish is writing back. He's saying, hey, okay, you're doing research on the red bones. Here are the families that we know to be red bones. And he gives a list. Are you ready for them? Ashworth, 
Goins, this is a name in my family tree, Perkins, Drake, a name also in my family tree, Hooser, Sweet or Sweat, Buxton, Doyle or Dial, Johnson, and Exclavant. These people keep pretty well together and marry amongst themselves mostly, but occasionally a white man or a white woman marries among them, he says, but if they do, it's generally a low class of white people. It is a very unpleasant situation to live about these people. And for this reason, they are not looked on as being Negroes, Indians, nor white people. And as this is white people's country, the white people don't put themselves on equality socially with any other people except white people. Although some of these people are perfect gentlemen and ladies and well-educated, I think they get along exceedingly well and peaceably considering all of these drawbacks I've given you uh, as near to the facts. I am trusting we'll give you the desired information. Yours truly, A. Rig Maiden. This letter is incredible. This letter is amazing. Now, does he have a bias? Does he have a perspective? He's filtering information through Yes, of course he does. But we're getting so much information about how the red bone community was perceived from contemporaries on the outside. Now, we'll obviously, we'll need to do a video on looking at how did the red bones see themselves? How did they identify? Now, here's another letter. This is from 1897. So again, these are, this is over 100 years ago. This group is being discussed as a separate group. So this was to an editor of a paper called the News and Courier. It's about the Goins family, that's what it says. Among that isolated and mixed breed people of privateer township who are classed as colored, but should properly be known as red bones, is found the name Goins, the founder of this family. So I have been told was a quote, yellow man whose wife was a mixed breed Indian. And, and he goes on to talk about one of the Goins family members. And he says, quote, his features are copper colored skin and show the presence of Indian blood in his veins. Another descendant of the Goins couple is Tom Gibbs, pastor of the little church in Southeastern Privateer, which is attended by the Red Bone people. So they have their own community. They have their own church. They're being classified there. He's saying you shouldn't call them colored. And people are saying they're not white. They're not Negro. They're not Indian. They're just their own group. Now, is this a race of people? No, this is not a race. But this is a this is a isolated, multi-generational mixed group of people that are kind of sticking together. And he goes on to say, I might remark that this boy is a member of the Colored Watery Baptist Association. And he says, I think Gibbs shows his Indian blood. While it would greatly puzzle the ethnologist to determine what percentage of white, Negro, and Indian blood flows through their veins. The name is or was found among that peculiar people, the Croatans of North Carolina, which unique race is believed by historical investigators to be the descendants of Sir Walter Raleigh's famous lost colony. Okay, this is a lot. And again, it's a, another primary source showing that the red ones are considered their own group. So let's go back in time a little bit now. Let's go to the early 19th century. No man's land. This was a uh, land that defied the rule of nations. It was also known as the neutral ground or the neutral strip. So imagine this vast territory in between Louisiana and Texas. This is a land of swamps, of virgin forests. This land became so hotly disputed between the United States and Spain after the Louisiana Purchase. The United States was saying that we owned all the way to the Rio Grande. Spain is saying no, it ends at the Red River. What happens is they take this section that was disputed and because neither side would budge, it led to the creation of no man's land, the neutral strip. It was a land that was outside the jurisdiction of either nation. This is where the red bones lived. It wasn't Spanish, it wasn't American. And I think it really encapsulates this idea of the red bone experience of like, they don't belong in this group, they don't belong in this group, they don't, you know, this land doesn't belong to this nation, doesn't belong to this nation, it's just kind of on its own. And I found my family in this land, uh, going through this land a lot, through the records, and I think it was just fascinating to see the red bone people navigating the world that was often unkind to those who didn't fit neatly into societal norms. And this neutral strip just kind of reflected that in a geographical way. But it was more than just a refuge for the red bone people. It actually became a place of smugglers and pirates and illicit activities. Because remember, no nation was taking ownership or authority over this area. It was kind of a free-for-all. 
The area was so notorious that President John Quincy Adams himself once referred to this area as the back door to the United States. And among the most infamous characters to emerge from this period was John Murrell, who was a land pirate. His name was synonymous with lawlessness of the neutral zone. He had a band of outlaws. Now, a lot of those people were actually considered redbone, but not everybody who was a redbone was a pirate, obviously. But the neutral zone was also just another place for people to kind of do as they pleased without really any consequences. It was also a corridor for smuggling enslaved people, particularly after the importation of slaves was prohibited in 1808. And a legendary pirate named John Lafitte used the waterways of these two rivers, and he smuggled enslaved people and contraband goods into the United States. And it kind of just further added to this reputation as a place where, like, you know, it's just not a part of what everybody else is doing. But what about the Red Bones? So who, who are the Red Bones? Well, this question has intrigued, obviously, genealogists and historians and ethnologists for a long time. I mean, these letters are being written in the 1800s, and they're trying to figure out, who are the Red Bones? Can you tell me who these people are? Now, I think the majority consensus is that these are, people are considered a group of mixed-race individuals who are primarily in these areas of Louisiana, Texas, and South Carolina. And although their origins, uh, there's disputes, right? It's suggested that it's mostly a blend of Native American, European, and African. So you might say, hey, wait a second. That sounds a lot like being Melungeon or Creole. And you would be right. Their physical traits varied widely. And we've talked about this for folks who are Creole and, and Melungeon. But often you would have, you know, tan or darker skin that had a copper hue, high cheekbones, straight to wavy dark hair. But why would these people be a separate community? You know, when you see people that are mixed, it doesn't necessarily mean like, okay, now we're our own separate group. Well, why would they be considered their own group as opposed to being, you know, I don't know, like Melungeon or Creole. And you have to think about this time though. We talked about this a lot. It's a time when things were extremely dichotomous. Are you black or are you white? Well, as you can see from the letters, the red bones weren't considered either. So the formation of this group has to be has to be considered in light of the historical and geographical reality that they are living in. And a lot of people will agree that, you know, the red bone group emerged from the complexities of racial mixing in early American history. What about the name? So the name itself is a riddle. What does red bone mean? There are so many explanations for what red bone means. I have read a ton. I'll tell you just a couple. I'm sure you know some more. Some people believe it just was a, just because folks had kind of a reddish hue to their skin. Others proposed that it was just, it was just kind of a derogatory term. I've read stuff where it had to do with being in an area with a lot of red clay and it had something to do with that. And then there was another one. I think it was a Caribbean term and it was it looks like it's spelled red ebo, but I think it's pronounced red bone and it has to do with folks who are mixed. That's that's basically what it means. So I'd love to delve into that a little bit more and do a side by side of Melungeon to Creole to Red Bone. And I think if there was a Venn diagram, we would see that yes, these are distinct communities, but there's a ton of overlap as well. There's a last name that comes up a lot in Red Bone history. It's the last name Nash. And my family married into the Nash family in Natchitoches, Louisiana in 1816. And there is, if, if you have a uh, red bone lineage, or if you think you do, one of the, the major things to look at is the location where your family lived. So El Camino Real was, was the king's highway, essentially. And it was going through these posts. Natchitoches, Louisiana, over in the east, was a post. It's connected all the way to Nagadoches, Texas, what's now Texas on the other end in the west of this road. And people were traveling between Natchitoches and Nacogdoches a lot. And they were connected by El Camino Real. Actually, I was on El Camino Real for a little bit when I went to Louisiana. I didn't have a full understanding of what that meant. And now I do and what was happening. But but these people, the red bones, were, were going back and forth between these two places. And, and that's, you see a strong sense of the communities on either side of this road. 
And so there's definitely more to talk about. I think this is just a little bit of an overview. You know, so I think if we're considering the Melungeons or, you know, in Appalachia and the mountains of Tennessee, things like that, we would see the Red Bones further south connected by El Camino Real. I'm excited to delve into what this means because I said a lot of the families uh, in the Red Bone community are just, they're people in my family tree. And so it's obvious to me that my mom's grandmother has ties to that family through her mom's side. So let me know if you've heard about Redbone, maybe in your family tree, or maybe your Creole or your Melungeon, and you're realizing, okay, there's a lot of overlap here, and maybe you had no idea any of this existed, but I'm sure that if your family is from one of these areas long enough ago, you're probably connected too. So come on along for the ride. Uh, and one of the, a couple of the names just off the top of my head, like I said, that I remember in my family, Goins, Nash, Drake, Chavez, or Chavis, Gibson, and these people kind of stayed together, intermarried, pretty tight-knit group. So I'm really enjoying just seeing, as I'm researching, how this group became solidified, I think, based on the geographical history of the time. I mean, they essentially, they didn't fit anywhere, just like no man's land didn't fit between either nation. And, and so they were kind of able to find this safe haven and define themselves freely in a place that didn't require you to be defined. And I think that's kind of a beautiful thing. So I'm looking forward to diving into this some more. Let me know what you think, and we'll talk soon.